Hello, everybody. Part three of our um, fire is a physical process. So we understand the uh, the background as to how something can catch fire. So, but how in wildland fire ecology are things actually catching fire? So ignition happens um, with two primary sources: lightning and humans. Uh, lightning usually comes from thunderstorms, um, and in California, this is a process that happens due to orographic lifting. And when we talk about um, the the climate and the weather uh, in future lectures, we're going to go into um, detail about why exactly that is. But when we talk about orographic lifting, we're basically talking about the idea that um, because we have a lot of topography in California, uh, mountains and foothills, that because of the way that air masses move, because the air mass has to go up over the mountain, that results in building up pressure that ends up in um, thunderstorm, ends up in um, rain and, and thunderstorms. So uh, where we see the majority of the lightning happening is in the Sierra Nevada mountains and the southeastern deserts. Not all ignitions result in fires. In fact, um, it can be as little as you know, like like one percent um, on average. Um, some places have found it's it's about a quarter, about 25 percent. Um, mm -hmm. But um, one of the things that's interesting is that um, when we really look at the landscape of the past, you kind of see that this landscape of of lightning, um, lightning, fi uh, lightning ignited fires, as well as um, cultural ignited fires or, or um, you know, anthropogenic fires. Um, we really, you can kind of look back and, and trace um, the idea and really see that, that both of these have an influence on the past landscape. So uh, really just kind of trying to take a look at California. So um, breaking it down into the two main ones and then um, because it's been it was a big thing um, a couple of years ago we've also kind of um, looked at power lines even though that really is a human caused uh, fire but just kind of separate that one out on this um, map here on the right so you can see where we get a lot of lightning started fire so you see that the majority of lightning fires so we got the transverse mountains here we see some lightning fires we got the Sierra Nevada mountains here so we see a lot of lightning fires we got the the coast range up here you see that's where we see a lot of lightning fires up in the mountains and then some out in the southeastern uh, desert area as well um, lightning there's so there's lightning that come with thunderstorms and then there's also dry lightning so dry lightning is where you get a storm you get everything in the storm except for the rain and though that's really bad you see that um, more in the western United States than you do um, just specifically in California. Um, duration is a major factor of the lightning ignition. So um, um, how long and how much power uh, it gets hit with. But it, it has to do with all the other things. What does it hit? Um, is that fuel dry and ready and is it wet? Um, all those things become problems. Anthropogenic causes, cigarettes, equipment, spar uh, equipment sparks, arced power lines, um, those sorts of things are, um, are common causes. Oops, too far. There we go. So with, a, um, with fire growth. So wildfires generally start at a single point. We call that a point source fire because they usually start at a single um, point. Um, sometimes there's a delay between the ignition and the spread, so it doesn't always necessarily, like, boom, it ignites, and then the fire spreads. So why does that happen? And it's because the conditions need to be right. So maybe the fuel needs to dry out more, the weather needs to change. What you could have is you could have a thunderstorm overnight. You get a tree that gets zippered, um, where a lightning uh, lightning bolt hits it and strikes it and there's kind of a fire and it's just sitting there simmering and smoldering and not really going anywhere but all of a sudden then the next day comes it um, you get the temperature to change you get a little bit of wind the fuels dry out and then all of a sudden then you can get the fire to grow because we need those those conditions to be right we need that that combination of fuel heat and oxygen to really get the thing to to move and so uh, let me slide myself out of the way so with a point source fire fire spreads most rapidly in the direction of the wind and if it's uneven terrain uh, most rapidly upslope 
So um, usually we'll see wind-driven fires, and usually we'll see fires run upslope or uphill. Um, the fastest spreading part of the perimeter is the head of the fire or the or the fire fire front. The slowest part is the back, and the the sides are called the flanks. And so if we look right here, you'll also you might hear some terminologies like spot fire or fingers or island or pocket. So an island is an area of unburned fuel. Probably this fuel was too wet. And so the fire, fire is just going to kind of grow. It just wants to go. It doesn't want to slow down. It needs to keep going. It needs to keep burning. It needs to keep moving or else it's going to die. So if it hits something where it's, it's going to have to spend too much energy, it would rather just take the path of least resistance. It just wants to go where it can burn stuff and keep moving. It doesn't want to deal with something like this. A pocket is where we you have an area of unburned fuel, fingers. You can just see these, you know, the little parts of the fire sticking out ahead. And a spot fire is when it's out in front of the fire, setting another part on fire. So growing from a point of ignition, a fire in uniform fuels on smooth terrain will achieve an elongated um, elliptical shape under the influence of wind. So if you've got a wind-driven fire, you're going to end up with this elongated elliptical uh, shape, more than likely. Now, it really also just depends on path of least resistance, because like I just said, fire just wants to burn. So whatever it takes to just keep burning is what it wants to do. So what you're going to get a mostly elliptical shape, but fire burns in all sorts of different types of shapes because it's just going, it just wants to burn stuff. Wherever the easiest way to burn is, that's what it wants to do. Um, length to width ratio with a fire is usually greater with increasing wind speed, um, but the closer to uniform conditions, the more elliptical that shape gets. And the variations in shape will be because of fuel type changes, um, barriers or islands that it hits, the effect of slope and wind, and then the amount of spotting happening during the fire. So ignition probability. This is one I really want you guys to think about because um, we've talked about this process before, but I really want you to get this, this right here on the right, this graphic here. How do things ignite? So it says, um, if you take a match to a piece of paper, um, when the fire is held to the paper, the molecules that are bound closely to one another on the surface of the paper are loosened by the heat. Those molecules start moving around. We talked about that before in the past. So the idea that, that the molecules are loosened around and the, those molecules start moving because the temperature rose. Remember we talked about temperature rising and the molecules do more movement. If temperatures cold or slow the molecules don't move as much. So the temperature rose, the molecules are moving. We've got the oxygen in the air and they're always ready to party so these molecules combine with the oxygen molecules and then we got combustion and that's how we get things to burn right so then let's talk about the probability of that happening and that's ignition probability so all of these ignitions occur by heat transfer um, ignition depends on the variable temperature of the heat source which is also known as the heat flux and time so the, the variable temperature of the heat source. So how hot can we get the, the heat source and then also time? Can it sustain that hot heat for a long time? Because we need to get these particles, these molecules, to move around a bunch and loosen up so that they can hit each other, and, or sorry, hit, hit the oxygen molecules and then combine to make that combustion. So the probability of a start, it is a function of the fine dead fuel moisture, which we talked about with those time lag classes, the fuel temperature, how hot we can get it and how much heat we can get it to keep, the surface to area volume ratio, the packing ratio, and then the characteristics of our firebrands, which he said are the any that kind of burning material is a firebrand, something that can that can carry fire. So that takes us to the third part of um, understanding fire as a physical process, which is fire behavior. And when, we're, when we talk about fire behavior, there is the fire behavior triangle or the fire environment triangle. Now we had the, the fire triangle, fuel, heat, and oxygen. But when we talk about the fire behavior triangle, or you'll hear people say the fire environment triangle, that is fuels, weather, and topography. And so when we're talking about um, 
weather, we're talking about the temperature outside, the relative humidity, wind, precipitation, atmospheric stability. We're going to talk about all those things in uh, when we discuss chapter three of the book, which is fire weather. With fuel, we've talked about a lot of these things already. The availability of the fuel, is it ready to burn? The continuity, do we have that patchiness or do we have uniform fuels? The arrangement of the fuels, are they compact? Are they tight together? Are they, are they spaced? Are they, um, are they arranged in a way that is conducive for burning? The size of the fuels, that surface to area, surface area, the volume ratio, the dryness or the moisture content of the fuels, the temperature, the conditions of the fuel. And then with topography, we're going to talk about the, the shape of the land, the steepness of the slopes and the aspect. Um, and we're gonna we we're gonna discuss a lot of those things, but let's just kind of talk about the idea of fire interaction with the environment right now. So the the fire in the center here um, of the the fire of the fire behavior triangle symbolizes the interaction between the weather, the topography, and the fuels. The fire itself can influence the environment and the fire behavior. It can change. The, um, the weather patterns, it can change um, whether the fuel is available um, or not. Um, so it's there's all sorts of ways that the environment uh, interacts with fire and can change what's happening. So let me move myself down here. So let's talk about fuels then, because we've spent a bunch of time talking about fuels. So what kind of fuels are out there? Um, basically, the ones we'll really focus on are aerial fuels, surface fuels, and then what we're also going to focus on is, you see there's nothing in between here. If the forest is clean and nice in the way we want it to, there's nothing in between here. But if the forest is um, overgrown or um, it's, there's too many things in the forest, what we'll see is we'll have this a middle section here called ladder fuels. And the ladder fuels connect the surface fuels to the aerial fuels. And this could be problematic um, with these large scale mega fires and crown fires that we get. Because you, if you get a fire burning on the surface here, no big deal, the trees, and that'll be fine. But if you have a bunch of shrubs or you got a bunch of vines or you got small trees and medium sized trees and big trees, now all of a sudden there's ways to go from a fire can go from the surface up into the aerial fuels. And so we have our surface fuels, brush, needle, twigs, grass, logging, slash. We've got our aerial fuels, which is our branches and our leaves and our, our trees up here. But you can also have ladder fuels in the middle that can connect those two. And we really don't want to have ladder fuels because we'd love to be able to have surface fires um, and avoid crown fires, which we see in our when we have our mega fires. That's when you'll see uh, crown fires and you'll see a lot of um, a lot of things just being destroyed, and so when we think about um, our fuels, um, like we talked about before, something like this, you can see that there are ladder fuels here because you can see that there's not much difference between what's going on down below and then what's going on up here. You'd want a situation more like this where it be it be hard for fire to get up into the tops of the trees and take out the trees and the surface. Um, with topography, uh, we really want to think about slope and aspect. So we, we know that fire will run, um, will go faster uphill. We know that because when we talked about heat transfer and we talked about the phases of combustion, we know that um, preheating is an important phase in combustion. And if we have um, convection and radiation and conduction, all three forms of heat transfer happening because we've got a slope with a fire running uphill that can become problematic. And we know that fire wants to run uphill because it's the path of least resistance because you get all three methods of heat transfer. Aspect becomes important as well because aspect is the direction a slope is facing. And so what, um, if you've got a south or west facing slope here in the northern hemisphere, the sun is hitting it at the hottest part of the day. So those are going to be the sides of hills and mountains that get dried out the most. So that's where you're going to get dry um, grasses and shrubs. Whereas on the north side, it's going to be more wet 
and you're going to get more trees and shrubs on the north side. So um, you have to be very cautious if you're dealing with a south or west facing aspect of a, of a hill or a mountain. You also want to think about canyons and, and things like that where if you get a strong push of wind, that can become problematic. And weather, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about weather and all the different things, but really we're going to focus on temperature and relative humidity, wind speed, and precipitation because precipitation is how, is how we get our moisture. So let's talk about the flaming front. So when we talk about the flaming front of the fire in terms of fire behavior, that's the area between the area of the fire between its leading edge and its trailing edge. So um, there's this whole list of different terminology for the flaming front. So let's talk about rate of spread. Um, you've heard that term. You've heard me mention that term before. So that's the speed at which the flaming front moves forward. Usually it's measured in um, distance per time. And for forestry, since we um, measure our distances in chains, we usually talk about fire moving in terms of chains per hour. Sometimes you'll hear like um, miles per hour if it's a really fast moving fire. Um, sometimes you might hear feet per second, but usually you're probably going to hear, hear chains per hour. Residence time is the time it takes the flaming front to pass a point. So basically you pick, you say, you know, okay, there's that point. How long does it take for the fire to get where it is now to that point? And that would be, um, you know, and then go past that point. Okay, so... I picked this point right here, right? The fire got there. I'm going to time it. And okay, now the fire's past it and you stop. And that's the that's the residence time. The flame zone depth, so that's the distance from the basically the front of the flaming front to the back of the flaming front. And so you take your rate of spread times your residence time and that gives you the depth of the flame zone. Your reaction intensity is the rate of energy released per unit of flaming zone area. Your fire line intensity is the rate of energy released per unit length of the fire front. Your flame length is the average distance from the base of the flame to the highest point. And your heat per unit area is the total amount of heat released as the flaming front passes. So let's kind of look at some of those. So our flame depth, so our front of our, of our um, flaming front to the back of our flaming front is our flame depth depth and that gives us our active flaming zone our flame length is our average length from the from the tops of the flames to the base of the flames um move myself out of the way right here so you can kind of see the same thing so flame length flame height is just how tall they're getting and then um the flame depth and you can kind of see this with an actual um fire so there's our flame length there's our flame height this is our flame depth from right here to right here. And so um, flame length is much more important than flame height because um, we're really seeing, um, it helps us kind of see the direction of the wind. And it also kind of really tells us, you know, if there were no wind, well, how high, how high would this thing actually be? Because the, the flame length is usually much longer than the, the flame height if it's a wind driven fire. And that takes us to Rothermel's fire spread equation. Um, because this whole time we talked about how, how do we understand fire? How do we, how do we figure out and study fire? So with uh, Rothermel's fire uh, spread equation, this uh, came about in 1972. And it was uh, determined because they wanted to figure out um, fire spread uh, terms. But they wanted to, to um, come up with a model because there had been previous models, but they wanted to come up with a model that used the fire environment, fire behavior triangle of fuel, weathers, fuel weather and topography. So they really wanted something that was going to incorporate the ideas of fuels, weather and topography into the fire spread model. So this model, the Roth and Mel model, predicts rate of spread of the flaming front for surface fires. It gets used for all sorts of types of fires, but that's what it was designed for, for the flaming front of surface fires. It's the most commonly used model since the 70s, and it's um, used in a program that's used um, to predict um, fire fire spread um, called Behave. It's a There's Behave and Behave Plus, and there are computer models um, where you can create simulations to 
um, show how a flat fire would move and it's all based on Roth and Mills fire spread model. So let's um, talk about it. This is a good place to pause and you can um, click right here on fire spread and really kind of um, look at this YouTube video and get a, a little more detail into it. But let's talk about the different pieces here. So rate of spread of surface fires, the flaming front of surface fires is what we're getting with all of these um, inputs here. So what are they? So we've got reaction intensity, which we talked about, the energy um, released, uh, and it's measured in BTUs per square foot um, per minute. You got the propagating flux ratio, fancy terminology, but what that means is it's the proportion of the reaction intensity um, that heats the adjacent fuel particles to ignition. We've got an effect of wind and an effect of slope. So things that are going to drive our fire because we know now remember these are the these are the numerator, not the denominator. So in terms of the numerator, these are things that are going to be positives that are going to make fire spread more. So the the amount of energy we're getting, the amount of energy released, and then the proportion of this energy that is heating adjacent fuel particles. So doing that preheating that we know is really important to fire spread and getting that preheating happening. And then also we know we got a lot of wind or we got a lot of slope. Those are going to drive fire and make fire go faster. Things that are going to slow fire down, bulk density. So the amount of oven dry fuel per cubic foot of fuel bed, or basically if we have a lot of stuff, because even though you say, whoa, but if we have a lot of stuff, that's going to, um, that means that there's a lot of stuff to burn. Yeah, but we've talked about the idea of if there's too much stuff or if it's really thick stuff, fire needs to spend more heat so it's not going to move as fast. We have the effective heating number, so the proportion of the fuel that is raised to ignition temperature. So the idea that, um, that how much of this fuel has to get raised to ignition temperature versus how much of it is already ready to go. And then we also have the heat of pre-ignition. So the amount of heat required to ignite one pound of fuel. And if you say, well, but pre-ignition is something that we want. We want um, things to, you know, we want to get pre preheated. Yes, we do, but we have to spend heat to do that. We have to spend energy to do that. So that energy is going to take away from our rate of spread because that's energy being spent to preheat stuff that can't be spent, you know, driving the fire faster. And so all of that is what goes into this fire spread model. So in understanding the equation, when we talk about rate of spread, we still have to understand it can change greatly due to the changing fire conditions. Um, so when we look at rate of spread, we really look at it as an average value over time. Uh, the fastest rate of spread is forward because that's where the head of the fire is. But wind and slope can have dramatic changes. That's why they were up there in the numerator part of the uh, equation. Um, and then um, the fuel element has the greatest effect of rate of spread on a surface fire um, when we're talking specifically about fine dead fuel. So small twigs, grass, litter, because they can, um, you can change the moisture con in content in them so easily. They can get preheated and dried out and, um, and burn up so quickly and have that huge surface area, um, surface area to volume. So, um, those things, uh, become really important in terms of rate of spread to show how fast a fire is going to move. So here's just kind of, um, a graphic to kind of give you a, a look at that. So a no wind fire, you'll see kind of that more of what you would think about like a campfire where you get the fire kind of building up and you get that TP shape. Whereas a wind driven fire is what we've seen in some of the other, um, other, uh, uh, images that I've shown you where you see this more of this bent over look where you're getting that convection and radiation and conduction happening all here and preheating of the fuels. We see that same thing happening with an upslope fire. We get that radiation, we get the convection, we'll have some conduction happening as well. And you, you'll you get, um, that's why um, fires move faster upslope. That's why with the wind, um, they really get get moving. 
and then you can kind of see this is a picture of a real fire uh, in the background here and it talks about the effect of topography and the the steepness of the slope um, talks about the weather conditions especially wind and temperature and then the idea of spotting which we're which we're going to talk about in just a little bit so let's talk about crown fires uh, quickly so a crown fire like this one in Yellowstone spreads through the overstory uh, it's one of the most spectacular wildfire phenomena um, they can be fast spreading and they can release a tremendous amount of heat in a short period of time and can be cut be very destructive in terms of fires so um, you can get them going as fast as seven miles per hour or 14 miles per hour in grasslands which um, you might not think sounds that fast you're like i like drive my car and go 70 miles an hour but if you think about like a huge fire moving at 14 miles an hour that's actually it's really fast because it's burning every single thing in there um, in that period of time the campfire um, a fire from a few years ago in paradise there were 70,000 acres burned in one day so an acre is a football field so if you think about the amount of ground think about 70,000 football fields being burned in one day um, you can with a crown fire you can get up to 150 foot flame links the tallest trees in California are um, 300 400 feet so you're you're talking about pretty much burning everything but the very very tallest trees in California here's a little graphic um, on the right about how just how quickly that campfire um, burned in paradise and where it came from and how the the low humidity um, with the strong winds just kind of had this thing blow up and if I move myself out of the way here and you really look at these pictures look at, keep an eye on this back corner here so, so it's seven o'clock in the morning right and we've said that fires can um, once the conditions get right things can change you can have a fire start overnight but then all of a sudden once the conditions change everything changes so not much going on at 702 at 707 right we start seeing there's a lot of buildup and it, this is 35 minutes um, total of the campfire so at 707 you can start to see the fire the the plume build up at 711 there's a lot of build up 718 we see this this part right here so we can see this thing's moving 726 that's monstrous and 737 all of a sudden we're looking and you're like that is a monstrous fire and that's what we're looking at here as well this idea of it just plowing through and moving extremely fast so there are three types of crown fires as classified by Van Wagner in 1977 um, the first type passive so in a passive crown fire you can get single and group tree torching so you can get um, one tree that gets the whole thing um, the whole thing uh, catches fire or you can get a group of trees that catch fire but it's still a surface fire that's a passive um, or dependent um, crown fire an active crown fire is where it's the fire is in the crowns of the trees and it's spreading simultaneously with the fire on the ground the worst kind is if you get an independent ground fire and that's where you don't even need the fire on the ground anymore it's just burning through the aerial fuels and so with a passive crown fire it's a surface fire burning surface fuels every once in a while it will connect through a ladder fuel or something to aerial fuels an active crown fire it's a surface fire but there's ladder fuels or something else that is allowing it to burn the aerial fuels as well an independent crown fire you don't need a surface there is no surface fire or there might be a surface fire um, with it as well but there doesn't have to be and it's burning just through the aerial fuels and so here's um, and then here's some pictures of some jack pine and so um, from Canada and it says that a over here this is a surface fire B right here is a passive crown fire so you're getting that that um, single tree torching or group tree torching so in this instance it's group tree torching and then C is an active crown fire so you've got surface fire 
that is then allowing uh, fire to get up into the crowns of the trees. So Rother Mill in 1991 um, adds to this classification and comes up with the idea of um, of crown, crown fires based on the relationship between fire and wind. So there are wind-driven fires where the power of the wind is greater than the power of the fire or plume-dominated fires where the strong convection column that builds up vertically above the fire actually starts causing um, turbulent indrafts and starts pulling in wind and actually starts driving the fire itself. And so those types of fires, that's where we talked about before this idea that, that the fire can start changing um, the, the fire environment triangle or the fire behavior triangle because the fire can actually change the, um, the weather um, but if it's one of these plume dominated fires. So how do we get crown fires or kind of um, another way to think about it is what are the things we really want to avoid? Um, if you have dry fuels, low relative humidity, high temperature, heavy accumulation of down dead litter, the presence of ladder fuels, steep slopes, strong winds, unstable atmospheres, or continuous conifer fields, those are all things that are going to favor crown fire. So now if you say, okay, let's think about these mega fires in the Sierra Nevadas right now. What are the things that we see in the Sierra Nevadas right now? Dry fuels, because we have had drought. We can get days with low relative humidity and high temperature. We have heavy accumulation of down dead litter because there are um, a lot of trees, millions of trees due to beetle kill. We've got ladder fuels because we haven't had enough fire and enough good fire in these areas. The Sierras definitely have street, steep slopes. They definitely have strong winds. They definitely have these continuous conifer fuels. So if we get a day with unstable atmosphere, it's very possible to have a crown fire. Another um, another thing that we really need to kind of keep an idea about or just um, really understand is the idea of spotting by firebrands. And so we've talked about the idea of firebrands before, pieces of burning material. Um, so if they're carried uh, beyond the main perimeter of the fire, that's called spotting. And they can cause spot fires or new starts that then can burn into the main fire or can start other fires and then you have multiple fires going and then that's where you get um, sometimes you can get the you'll see fires called the fire complex now that can be just because there was one fire over here and one fire over there and then they kind of grew together or you can get it where you have the spotting thing where you got one fire burning over here and then it starts a spot fire over there and now you got this plus you got 20 other little fires um, and it becomes, you know, that you have to manage multiple fires instead of just one. And um, if you can get, if you get certain conditions, if you get um, really weird weather patterns, you can have spot fires happening miles in front of the flame, um, the, the active flame in front where the wind just carries the, the firebrands far away. Um, sometimes uh, spotting is uh, important for fire growth in, in some places like Alaska where you need it to spot because you don't have that continuous fuel. It's patchy fuels um, due to, you know, having just like frozen tundra. Um, but can um, usually it's um, something thought about as problematic for um, controlling fire. So just here's some examples. So we get the main fire front here. We got our wind direction and then we got our embers sending spot fires up ahead. You can see here's our fire up here, but you can see that some spot, fi some uh, fire brands were sent up ahead. And so we got spot fires burning up ahead. Same thing here, the main fires along this ridge, but then these burning embers fall and we got these spot fires now here on this other edge. Up here, smoke and wind, loft so we get our convective heating and in our convective column that's where these burning embers come out and then we get these spot fires we also get this preheating happening so we can end up having a, a much bigger fire or many fires that we didn't want to deal with and so um, what does that look like in real life so here's two pictures so here's the fire burning on this ridge back here sends off an ember starts a spot fire here now all of a sudden we've got a finger of the fire so we still got our main fire here but now it's burned all the way 
and it's got that spot fire too. So now we've got to try and control this fire here and here and back there now. So um, spotting is definitely problematic. So trying to just kind of um, not really summarize it, but just kind of put uh, some of these terms and things that we've learned about um, with uh, different uh, different ideas. So right here, this fire observation description on the left, so smoldering, creeping, running, torching, spotting, crowning, erratic, and extreme. So what does that look like? So for a running fire, organized surface flame front, four to eight feet, in surface fuels, moderate rate of spread, vigorous surface fire, may see some candling or torching along the perimeter within the fire, crown fire, organized crown front, moderate to long range spotting, independent spot fire growth, black to copper colored smoke, 12 to 18 foot flames. So kind of just give you some ideas and give you some pictures to go along with the terminology. And then also here talking about fuel loading, fire line intensity, and the typical behavior for some different uh, vegetation types uh, within California, a little more specific um, than um, these are really um, a lot of stuff you'll see in the Sierra Nevada mountains and foothills. And so just kind of, uh, I put this picture at the end of our lecture here to just kind of get you to start thinking about the fire environment because that's um, one of the next things we'll talk about is the interaction of fire and the ecosystem. But we're going to talk about the, the climate and the weather because that's really important. That's where we're going to go next. And then we'll talk about fire in the ecosystem. But we ought, but we got to think about the fire environment. It's the weather, the fuels, and the topography. And then also what we've got to think about because it's important to us is the human environment and the human aspect of all this and how it fits in with these fuels, topography, and weather and and the fire because this is california california is a fire environment and we have to just kind of get used to the idea that fire is part of this land and how are we going to live with it how are we going to learn about it how are we going to have enough knowledge so that we can make it part of our lives without it being a problem every time we think about it and hopefully that's what we get out of this class i know there was a lot of terminology a lot of things to think about today but that's the idea of trying to study fire and, and learn fire and understand that there's a lot of science behind this. It's not just like, well, yeah, there's fire and it burns. There's a lot more to it. So um, as always, contact me if you have uh, any issues. And uh, other than that, hope you enjoyed it.